In the fall of 2006, a collection of Northwest Coast Aboriginal art known as the Dundas Collection sold for almost $8 million U.S., far above the value estimated by world-famous auction house Sotheby's in New York. Where did this collection come from, and why is it so highly valued, especially when considering that Aboriginal art has not always been considered fine art? The story of the Dundas Collection is talked about by museums and collectors throughout North America and Europe, but for the people of the Northwest Coast in British Columbia, it is a story of their struggle to regain their lost treasures. Join us as we try to find answers to some of the questions that surround these lost treasures of the Northwest Coast. In 1859, the Evangelical Missionary Society, an arm of the Anglican Church in England, sent one William Duncan to establish a new mission at Fort Simpson on the northwest coast of British Columbia, where the Hudson's Bay Company had established a trading post. His goal was to build a mission to convert the Simshan people to Christianity. Because Duncan was not an ordained minister and therefore could not baptize his converts, he invited Reverend Robert J. Dundas to conduct the baptisms for him. And in return, Reverend Dundas requested that Duncan collect and give to him exotic objects made by the Simshan people. Robert Dundas was a missionary from England who visited British Columbia in 1863. Dundas also kept a journal. And in that journal, he inscribed his memories of uh, his trip to Metlakatla. We spent the morning examining some Indian curiosities that Mr. Duncan had collected for us. I was anxious to obtain some of the medicine men's implements and tools and succeeded in getting some. Here is a collection that was documented to a very precise point in time in October of 1863 when, when uh, Reverend Dundas acquired the collection. Reverend Dundas ended up taking an entire collection back to England. And over time, Reverend Duncan provided a mail order service with hundreds of objects being sent to England. The Museum of Anthropology here at the University of British Columbia is one of many North American museums that house Aboriginal artifacts. But the vast majority of Aboriginal artifacts, numbering at almost 17,000, are held in British museums. And we can be almost certain that Reverend Duncan played a role in providing some of those items. Both the collection and the journal remained in the hands of Dundas and then his children, his grandchildren, and finally his great-grandson, Simon Carey. Uh, until 2006. It was evident that, you know, uh, Simon Carey wanted to sell the collection, but um, wasn't sure on, you know, what to charge for it, so he sort of looked around and talked to many people about what it might be worth. Well, you know, that went on for another 30 years. I think it was an extremely sophisticated um, sale procedure. The Dundas uh, auction, which is at Sotheby's in October of 2006, uh, obviously commanded some very high prices, since the, the, in total, the more than 50 lots sold for, for more than $7 million US. When I started my career 40 years ago, uh, the prices of masks were, you know, in the thousands, but not in the hundreds of thousands or millions. Uh, so that has been a tremendous shift. In, uh, in relative values. I think we expected it might make five million, but it actually made seven. 
The Museum of Civilization here in Ottawa is considered a leader in collecting and exhibiting Northwest Coast Aboriginal art and over the last 30 years has wanted to acquire the Dundas collection and recently purchased four pieces from the auction in New York and two additional pieces from a private dealer. The Canadian Museum of Civilization was able to bring together uh, approximately $100,000 US um, to take to the auction and we hope to acquire a certain limited number of things. We knew that we could not command anything as some in the millions of dollars. The Canadian institutions that were represented were the Museum of Northern British Columbia, Canadian Museum of Civilization, but there were also private interests represented, the Thompson family particularly. Donald Ellis is an internationally renowned tribal art dealer who purchased the majority of the Dundas collection on behalf of Canadian private collectors and museums. It was a watershed event. It proved that we can compete in the world. It proved that when we want something that belongs to us, um, we were able, thanks to the grace of a couple of philanthropists, mm -hmm. step up to bat and, and win. Were, you, were your buyers surprised? Or? Most of my buyers were surprised with not how high the prices were, but by how inexpensive some of the prices were. Really? Mm -hmm. And so they were prepared to pay more than they did? We're in, in many instances, we were prepared to pay significantly more. How would you set a price to these objects? When we're talking about values, you, it's rarity and condition, and most importantly, beauty. Right. But in this collection, the Dundas collection, um, was a very important collection. It was the last field collection from the 19th century still in private hands that, that we're aware of. And it has a, a great deal of history attached to it. Knowledge of the kinds of things that people in Metlakatla had in their homes, the kinds of things that were on the coast, the kinds of uh, knowledge that, was, that went into those objects through their hand, through their eye, their mind, and stayed in those objects for us to see now, which is more than 140 years later. The mask here, uh, which was the most expensive object in the sale, this sold for $1.8 million at auction. And what did this particular item sell for? And I what range? I believe this sold for 660000 I believe. This is uh, generally perceived to be one of the two or three best examples known. It is extraordinarily well carved. It is. It's beautiful. Masterful, in fact. What was this item purchased for? I believe just under a half a million dollars. Aboriginal art hasn't always been considered fine art. So what would you say about these items? Are they considered fine art? This particular object here, in my, not just in my opinion, but in the opinion of most people who, who uh, experienced it, um, holds its own in any place at any time with great Greek and classical antiquities, with, mm -hmm. with anything. It, can, it, could, it could stand in the company of anything ever created and, and hold its own. I think it is a, a highly sophisticated art. It was as sophisticated as anything that ever came out of Africa or Asia or out of Europe for that matter. And the European nations are the ones who've been writing the art history and saying, that's tribal art, that's ethnographic art, it's not real art, ours is the real art. So I think that's starting to break down, I think it's a good thing that it's starting to break down, but it's, a, it's been a slow uh, process. There has been a lot of recognition by leading figures like Claude Lévy-Strauss, you know, who has said that Northwest Coast art is as important to the history and art history of mankind as that of ancient China and ancient Egypt. There is a set of hidden rules uh, for creating these objects and symmetries that are part of, not, not just part of the aesthetic understanding, but part of the, the technical rules and the technical knowledge that every artist had to acquire and had to practice without fail. You, know, you had to become very good, very fast, or find another line of work. The Northwest Coast has climbed to absolutely the, the top rung of the ladder for indigenous arts of the world. This 
This land, a realm of islands and waterways near Prince Rupert, is the traditional territory of the Simshan people. We visited the Museum of Northern British Columbia in Prince Rupert to hear what the Simshan people had to say about the Dundas collection. I think there's pride in the collection. There is no pride in the way it was collected. Duncan kind of had a misunderstanding about our people, from the totem poles to the feast. Uh, his idea of it was, uh, we were heathens, we were praising the devil during these songs and these dances that were done. He didn't understand that it wasn't anything like that. Our Jim Shan people never ever wrote anything down. So these totem poles, these masks, these feasts is where all the history of that family was passed down. I always felt that in order for the culture to survive, they made it look like they were giving all, these, all this up to get baptized, but they really weren't. Honestly, they didn't have a choice. They had to give it up or go to jail. It, it was jail, Christianity, either one. So in order to stay out of jail, they gave them up. At the time, of course, the smallpox was considered the plague. So Duncan told them, it's the devil that's making you sick. So if you can give this up, I will baptize you and you'll become a Christian and you'll be saved. So it, it was kind of a scare tactic. At the time, it was uh, illegal to even carve these pieces. And yet, when you think about how did Duncan build a church, how did Duncan build a cannery? I mean, he did this by having these artists carve certain pieces that he sold to fund his church. This is Rose Island, where the community of Lachulams is located, the center of the nine allied Simshan tribes, where Reverend Duncan arrived in 1859, unannounced and uninvited. He wasn't a good person. I was taught that uh, through the stories my grandmother told us that we, we weren't to even to speak his name. He was here, but then he moved to Metlakatla. He got them to leave everything behind and move with him to Metlakatla, Alaska. Not only did he take the artifacts from our people and their regala, and they gave up their names to become under his leadership in Christianity, but to move the people to a new Melikatla, Alaska. And some refused to go. Uh, the ones that stayed behind, uh, they had to give up all of what they had uh, to live on to Duncan before they left. Reverend William Duncan, I don't really think anything of the guy to tell you the truth, you know. He's taken a lot of our culture, you know, our history away. He split our village up, you know, and split our people up too. I think he practically almost just took whatever he wanted. He was supposed to be a preacher. And what he did was wrong. I guess all the preachers are like that. <laughs> Reverend Duncan's influence has had a lasting effect of dividing community members between their traditional beliefs and Christianity. The majority of Christian converts moved to Metlakatla with Duncan. However, his legacy still remains today in Lachwalams. History has never changed. It's the only thing that's constant. You can't change it. That's the way we run our lives. The land belonging to me will go to my nephew, and he will take my name, and he will take the land. And when he dies, it'll go to his nephew. So it'll be always within the tribe. We're here at the Royal British Columbia Museum in Victoria, where the Dundas collection is being prepared to begin its national tour. You see these things all the time, but you never, you never are cease to appreciate the lines and uh, the, the shapes and the quality of work and the heart that goes into these pieces. Each item is being carefully examined, cleaned and measured, and prepared for safe transport in custom-made cases. Well, the Dundas collection really represents um, a time that other collections in Canada are not able to represent systematically. 
the, the 1860s. This is a collection that contains masks, it contains shamanic objects, it contains small dishes that we know were used for oil, it contains ladles, uh, it contains the two baskets that were part of the, the lots that the Museum of Civilization acquired. The art, particularly of the North Coast, is extremely appealing to people in much the same way as, as ancient Egyptian art is. And one of the things that's always intrigued me is how symmetrical both of those art forms are. Bilateral symmetry is a feature of Northwest Coast art, both in the flat design and in the sculptural forms. But particularly in the masks, the masks are almost perfect. This is a ladle. It would have been part of household equipment, used for food, uh, used perhaps at feasts, where large numbers of people came together in, in, in large houses. The ladle itself is made of the horn of a mountain sheep. It was steamed and bent and molded into the ladle shape. As with other Northwest Coast things, uh, it was expected to be done uh, with an impeccable precision of line um, and an impeccable flow, um, but entirely within the form of the object that contained the design. Let's talk about this club. This looks very interesting. These have had a name associated with them, which are called slave killers. There are about a little more than a dozen of these that, are, that have survived. And so what, what would they have used it for then? Heraldic, it was a, a prestige object. It could have been used in warfare. There have been four of these extraordinary clubs on the market in the 30 years I've been doing this. This is one of the two best ones. This is a comb. Uh, it's carved of wood, probably from a relatively hard wood, like you. It appears to be a bear, but you can also see a small human face just on the top, which is a very characteristic quality of Northwest Coast carving. A comb like this would have been very likely owned by someone of high rank, someone able to command the wealth to have something like this commissioned. A carving like this really required a very intimate, a very definite knowledge of all of the techniques of carving and all of the aesthetic requirements for representation. And what would this have been used for? It's called a grease dish. It would have held ulacon grease a rendered sort of small fish that was used to um, primarily to dip dried salmon in. This is extraordinarily well conceived. It's beautifully carved. This recurved beak is probably a Thunderbird. The uh, face image here is just haunting and very stark. While the purchase of these items represents a coup for Canadian museums and private collectors, for the Simshan people whose ancestors created it, there are mixed emotions as these stolen treasures are not returning to their rightful owners. Despite the efforts of the Simshan people working with the Museum of Northern British Columbia to acquire pieces of the collection, they managed to raise only enough money to purchase this spoon. We went to the feds and the provincial government, and uh, they only managed to come up with a little over 100,000. This was a huge part of Canada's heritage. These are the people that should have stepped up to the plate and said, you know, this is our heritage. We don't want uh, someone from the U.S. buying these pieces. They need to stay here in Canada. And unfortunately, they didn't do that. That's why I said I, I really have the utmost respect for those buyers uh, who stepped up to the plate and purchased these pieces. And they spent a huge amount of money on it just to keep them here. The national tour of the Dundas Collection premiered in March of 2007 at the Museum of Northern British Columbia in Prince Rupert, 
on Simshan territory in honor of the Simshan people. The past has placed museums, collectors, and curators, donors and owners, in a precarious and somewhat paradoxical position. The manner in which artifacts were collected in the past was often immoral and reprehensible. Most often, the biases and presumptions involved the belief in Euro-Canadian superiority which devalued and disrespected Native cultures and peoples. How do we overcome these forces of disrespect and repression in the present? We can start by establishing partnerships based on equal footings. If the hereditary chiefs ask the museum to assist them in some way, we are honor bound to do our best. There's a feeling of frustration because what our people had to give up when they became Christianity. When the missionary said, Give me your regala. Give me your artifacts. You no longer can have them. You are now a Christian. Is this the true way of the Lord? Or is the greed of the people at the time, when they seen the wonders of what was there and what was done by our artists, how well it was done? I'd like to see this stay here for our younger children to see and learn from. We have a lot here now, but, you know, this is awesome. This is it's unbelievable to see this here. Now that it's been brought back here and it doesn't belong to us, that's, that's the sad part. If it was here to stay for the rest of our children and grandchildren to to see it, it would be very good to tell them it belonged to us, but I'm glad that whoever made it possible brought it back here today. We work with the group that purchased these, and we ask if they could be the ones we could have showcased here first, so that we can bless them and put spirit life back into them before they're showcased. Northwest Coast art certainly shines as the apogee of indigenous art worldwide. The impact of the Dundas collection will be as a high watermark in re resetting the valuations on those collections and making museums realize what amazing wealth and value they have. I want to thank the people who bought the collection and brought it back to its original lands. The spirit of those pieces is coming through. It's really good to see them come home. When I go to New York, I see these old pieces and they want to come home with me. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time these pieces have heard the drums in 100, what, 50 years. Thank you because we could study them, we could look at them, we could learn them. It's lifted up our people.
fall of 2006, a collection of Northwest Coast Aboriginal art known as the Dundas Collection sold for record-breaking prices. I think we expected it might make five million, but it actually made seven. Everyone was interested in the outcome. Everybody wanted a piece of it. The mask here, uh, which was the most expensive object in the sale, it sold for $1.8 million at auction. Wow. This particular object holds its own in any place at any time. With great Greek and classical antiquities, with, mm -hmm. with anything, it could stand in the company of anything ever created. In 1863, Anglican missionary Robert J. Dundas acquired the collection while visiting Reverend William Duncan in Fort Simpson, British Columbia who was establishing a mission to convert the Simshan people to Christianity. The uh, people came under Christianity and became Christians and had to give up their regala, their artifacts. They didn't have a choice. They had to give it up or go to jail. It, it was jail, Christianity, either one. So in, in order to stay out of jail, they gave them up. At the time, it was a uh, illegal to even carve these pieces. At the time, of course, the smallpox was considered the plague. So Duncan told them, it's the devil that's making you sick. So if you can give this up, I will baptize you and you'll become a Christian and you'll be saved. The national tour of the Dundas Collection premiered in March of 2007 at the Museum of Northern British Columbia in Prince Rupert on Simshan territory in honor of the Simshan people. I'd like to see this stay here for our younger children to see and learn from. You know, this is awesome. This is this unbelievable to see this here. This is the first time these pieces have heard the drums in 150 years. We thank you because we could study them. We could look at them. We could learn again. It's lifting up our people. Thank you.